When a dead body is found in the swamp within the marsh of North Carolina, the locals have only one suspect, the marsh girl. One morning, a lifeless body is found in the swamp next to the abandoned fire tower. Sheriff Jackson and Deputy Joe Perdue soon arrive and identify the corpse as Chase Andrews. No footprints are seen on the ground, and they discover that one of the grates on the tower is open, with Chase's body right below. As they investigate further, Dr. Cohn estimates the time of death between midnight and 2 a.m. Chase's blood and hair found on the support beam imply that he banged his head on the way down. It sounds like an accident, but Chase should have fallen backward for his head to hit the beam. Thus, someone might have pushed him. Their only lead is the red wool fibers on Chase's jacket, which didn't come from any of his clothing. His demise becomes the talk of the town. In a diner, Tom Milton refuses to give his opinion on the case, saying he's already a retired attorney. Just then, a lady gossips about the Marsh girls involved involvement, thinking the girl is crazy enough to be up for something like this. Although Milton keeps quiet, the disapproving look on his face is obvious. The rumors eventually convince the sheriff and his deputy to question the outsider. The marsh girl lives alone in a shack deep in the marsh. The place is full of shells and bird feathers. Still, the suspect is nowhere to be found. Lucky for them, the door is left open. And when the deputy searches inside, he finds a red beanie that matches the fiber on Chase's jacket. As they continue to inspect the place, Kaya, the marsh girl, hides in the woods. The authorities return early the following day, riding a boat into the marsh. This time, they see the marsh girl on her boat, so Kaya throttles her engine to escape. As they chase her, she dives into the water, just to be caught by the deputy. Alone in her cell, Kaya is joined by a stray cat until an unexpected visitor comes to see her, Tom Milton. The retired lawyer volunteers to defend Kaya for free. He explains that she will stand before the jury and be judged when whether they know her or not. However, he can't help her when all he knows is her full name, Catherine Danielle Clark. Just as he's about to leave, he gives her a book about paintings of shells. The book immediately catches Kaya's interest, helping the lawyer gain her trust. She finally speaks up to share her childhood. Kaya lived in the shack with her family when she was little. She had happy memories of her ma, but her pa would hurt them whenever he felt like it, making their lives miserable. Ma would be beaten up trying to protect her children. This was until Ma couldn't bear the beatings anymore. She left and didn't even look back at her daughter chasing after her. Soon, Kaya's older siblings ran away as well. Finally, Jody, the brother closest to Kaya, decided to leave. Before he left, he told Kaya that whenever she was in trouble, she must run and hide deep in the marsh where the crawdads sing, like how Ma told them. With no one to lean on, the little girl learned to avoid being in Pa's way to live with him. The marsh became her haven. However, she couldn't find her way home home. So Tate, Jody's friend, helped her. Something about him eased the tightness in Kaya's chest. For the first time since her ma and Jody left, she felt brave enough to ask her pa for food. Pa took her to the general store owned by the couple, Jumpin and Mabel. While Jumpin and her father went out to fill their boat with fuel, Mabel talked to the shy girl. She encouraged her to go to school where she could learn and have free lunch. Convinced by the delicious food, Kaya reworked her ma's dress into a skirt and wore it to school, hoping she look more presentable. However, the townspeople and the kids looked down on her. This made poor Kaya run back home, deciding that she was better off learning from the wild. For a while, her pa was good to her, constantly reminding her to keep a distance from anyone, even Tate. He even gave her a bag from his old knapsack. That day, a letter from Ma arrived. Since Kaya couldn't read, she handed it over to Pa, who immediately burned the letter after reading it. He also got rid of Ma's belongings, and then one day, he was gone. Now, the the little girl was completely alone, but Kaya survived by selling mussels to jump in. The couple figured out that her father had abandoned her. Although her husband advised her not to meddle, Mabel gave the poor child clothes from church donations. Presently in prison, Kaya receives a new dress from Mabel, which she wears in her first trial. To her horror, the judge announces that she will face the death penalty if found guilty. To make matters worse, the public has already condemned her because of her disposition. After the hearing, Milton suggests considering the plea bargain. She must admit that she met Chase Andrews at the tower, but they had a disagreement that led to him stepping backward through the grate. Kaya would get 10 years in prison, but she could be out in 6 for good behavior. However, the Marsh Girl refuses to say anything that implies guilt. In the next hearing, the prosecutor insists that Kaya pushed Chase and covered her tracks. He claims that she had the time, motivation, and weakness of character to murder him. Kaya gets scared that his words are convincing, but Milton asks her to stay calm. Next, 
Milton urges the jury to look at the evidence, which implies that it's likely that no one killed Chase Andrews. He points out that the defendant is in the courtroom because it's easier to blame an outsider than to rely on facts. Although Kaya was born and grew up near the town, she is in fact an outsider. She raised herself to adulthood while isolated from the townspeople. This was until 1962 when Tate left a bird's feather for her. The feather became their secret message. When the boy realized that Kaya couldn't read, he volunteered to teach her. Tate patiently taught his friend how to write and read. Soon, they studied in her house, and the boy was amazed to see Kaya's sketches of the different creatures in the marsh. As they studied biology, Kaya searched for an explanation as to why a mother would leave her child. However, a young woman living alone in the wild caught the social service's attention. One day, Tate saw Kaya frantic as she tried to avoid those people, but he suggested it wouldn't be that bad if she stayed in a group home. He thought the girl shouldn't live in the marsh forever, which almost sparked an argument between them. Kaya felt bad for snapping at the only person she counted on, so she thanked him for everything he did for her. When she asked about his family, Tate shared that his mother and sister died in a car crash on the way to buy him a birthday present. He felt guilty, but Kaya assured him it wasn't his fault. At that moment, the two felt closer to each other and shared a kiss. The following days were magical to them. On Kaya's birthday, her boyfriend prepared a surprise for her. Consumed by their love, they made made out by the river. Before they went further, Tate stopped, afraid of damaging Kaya's life. Sadly, their relationship was short-lived as Tate must go away for college. Though Kaya understood that the boy couldn't stay, she was still disappointed. Before Tate left, he gave her a list of publishers and encouraged her to send her drawings since they were good enough for a book. However, Kaya didn't care because she thought Tate would never return. Tate promised that he would never forget about her and that he'll see her again on the 4th of July. Kaya held on to that promise, so she waited for him on the 4th of July, but he never arrived. That's when she realized that he left her for good. When life lost its meaning, the marsh got Kaya back up. After a while, her heartache seeped away like water into sand. During her trial, the sheriff testifies that not finding footprints or fingerprints around the body or on the tower indicates that somebody destroyed evidence. However, Milton reveals that it was a low tide when the victim arrived at the tower, so his footprints might have been washed away as the water rose. Under these circumstances, the absence of footprints doesn't suggest a crime. The retired lawyer also debunks another claim that someone opened the grate. He presents a copy of a written request from the sheriff's office, urging the U.S. Forest Service to take action on the grates because they were left open, which was dangerous. Sheriff Jackson confirms that he made the request. A year ago, Kaya met Chase Andrews, who was playing with his friends by the water. At that time, developers were also interested in Kaya's house, so she had to pay back taxes to keep ownership of the house. Because of her huge need for money, Kaya sent her book to the list of publishers Tate gave her. While she was dealing with the developers, Chase invited her on a picnic date. He seemed kind to her, making Kaya feel like her heart was ready for another love. Chase moved fast and started making out with her, but she pushed him away, saying she was worth more than a picnic. Afraid that he offended the girl, Chase begged Kaya to accompany him to the fire tower so he could make it up to her. Kaya hadn't been to the tower, but the view was breathtaking as she could see the whole marsh from above. After that, Chase persuaded Kaya to bring him to her house. He looked around the house and was amused by everything inside. His behavior confused the girl, but he told her he wouldn't do anything she didn't want. With some sweet words, the boy earned her trust. They spent more time together until they were in a relationship. However, whenever Kaya was in town, she avoided Chase to prevent nasty rumors. Soon, Kaya received news that a publisher was interested in her book. That night, Chase also arrived to invite Kaya for a drink. He was promoted at work, so he promised to take care of her and get her a nice house when they were married. Kaya couldn't believe it, but the promise of marriage made her happy. She even trusted Chase when he asked her to accompany him to Asheville, even though going out of town terrified her. They went on a night drive, and Chase decided to stay at a hotel. Kaya agreed, and he took her innocence, although it was short and unsatisfying for her. Nevertheless, the naive girl gave Chase a handmade shell necklace as a token of her feelings for him. In the present trial, Chase's mother claims that her son never took the shell necklace off, but when his body was found, it wasn't there. She speculates that whoever took it killed him. As Mrs. Andrews is testifying, Milton allows Kaya to keep sketching to calm her nerves. The woman continues that her son admitted he was romantically involved with the Marsh girl, but broke it off with her. Kaya seems surprised to hear this, and now, Mrs. Andrews claims it was her reason for killing her son. Before all of these happened, Tate finally returned. He went to the Marsh to see Kaya, but he saw her with Chase, making him decide not to show himself yet. One day outside Jumpin' Store, Tate wore the 
the red beanie the authorities found in Kaya's house. He overheard Chase talking lowly about Kaya to his friend. Tate got angry, and they nearly fought until Jumpin broke them up. That night, Tate went to Kaya's house to warn her about Chase, but the girl threw rocks at him. She was still angry at him for leaving her. So the boy explained that he thought he had to choose between Kaya and everything else in his life because she couldn't live outside the marsh. However, he realized that everything else meant nothing without her. That was why he returned. He admitted he was wrong and he was sorry, but Kaya didn't know how to forgive him. While in the town, Kaya bumped into Chase and was about to invite him over when she realized he was with friends. To her surprise, one of the girls introduced herself as Chase's fiance. Devastated, Kaya ran to her house. Once again, she must live alone, but she had known this all this time. After Chase, life seemed to be getting better. Her book, Shells of Carolina Marsh, was finally out, and her initial paycheck allowed her to pay for the back tax for the land. Thanks to the book, Jody found her, surprised that she remained in their shack. Unfortunately, she lost contact with their other siblings, and their ma died of leukemia. She tried writing their pa to get her children back, but he threatened to beat them if ma ever contacted them again. Kaya's heart sank upon hearing this, but at least Jody promised to visit her as much as he could. Sometime later, Kaya encountered Chase in Jumpin's store. When she attempted to avoid him, he assumed that Kaya thought she was too good for him now that she had published her book. The following day, Chase went to the marsh and tried to fool Kaya again with his words. When his scheme failed, he forced himself on her, but the girl grabbed a stone and hit his head until she escaped his hold. She threatened to kill him if he bothered her again. However, a witness heard her and later testifies in court, thus giving her a disadvantage. On that day, Kaya decided to stay out in the marsh, terrified that Chase would attack her again. While she hid, Chase was looking all over for her. Days later, she returned home, only to find her place was trashed. Since then, Kaya lived in fear, wondering when the next fist would fall. One night, Tate checked up on her. He was enraged to see the bruises on her face and immediately realized that Chase had done it. Kaya told him to stay out of it, but she couldn't shove him away easily. Kaya shared that she was supposed to go to Greenville next week to meet the publishers and talk about the next book. Tate urged her to go and stay there for a week to enjoy her life. Before Tate leaves, he offers Kaya his red beanie so that she won't feel cold. Kaya refused at first, but the boy insisted. Soon, Kaya asked Jumpin for the bus schedule, but seeing her bruised face, he figured that Chase had harmed her. He urged her to report this, but she refused to be dragged into the station to relive what happened, only for the newspapers to tarnish her name. On Kaya's next trial, Tate, Mabel, Jumpin, and Jody arrive to support her. Miss Price testifies that the day before Chase's death, she saw Kaya get on the 9 a.m. bus to Greenville. However, the prosecutor argues that no one saw who could have gotten off the night bus from Greenville. The lawyer implies that Kaya returned to Barkley Cove at 1 a.m., then returned to Greenville an hour later. When Kaya's publisher makes his testimony, he says that Kaya was with them in Greenville. However, he confirms that Kaya stayed in a separate hotel near the bus station, which only makes the prosecutor's theory more plausible. After the session, Milton tries to convince her to be on the stand, thinking it might help her. However, Kaya refuses, noting that people had always hated her when she did nothing. She insists that the jury can have their decision, but she won't beg for her life. On the last day, the lawyers make their final statements. While the opposing side convinces the jury to find the defendant guilty, Milton encourages them to look past the myths they've heard about the Marsh girl, and focus on the fact that there's no sufficient evidence to prove that a murder even occurred. For hours, Kaya's friends anxiously wait for the jury's decision. Finally, the jury finds Kaya not guilty, much to her relief. After the trial, Kaya's life slowly returns to normal. She realizes the only boy she loves is Tate, so they rekindle their relationship and later get married. Kaya continues to write books as they grow old together. During Kaya's last moments, she goes to the marsh, where she sees a vision of Ma welcoming her to the other side. Later, old Tate finds her dead on her boat. After some time, Tate goes through Kaya's belongings and finds her journal. There, she drew Chase, and on the last page is the shell necklace tainted with blood. At this moment, Tate realizes that Kaya did kill Chase since she believed that sometimes, for a prey to live, its predator must die. Still, he chooses to bury the truth to keep his wife's name untarnished. The Marsh knows all about death but doesn't define it as tragedy or a sin. Now that Kaya is gone, she is in the Marsh, way out yonder, where the crawdads sing. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.